This is the Hot Take Hockey Podcast with your hosts, Lucas and John Viveros. Hey everyone, we're back with the Hot Take Hockey Podcast, episode 18 with Lucas, myself, John. we got a big episode here, big time guest from TSN, James Duffy. So we're going to talk with the legend himself later on in this episode. We'll intro him, uh, talk with him about everything he's got going on and just have some hockey chats. But Lucas, man, to intro the app here, uh, a lot of hockey news lately, a lot of trade rumors. Uh, the Leafs on a roll right now, so we'll talk about that as well. But how are you feeling, man? How are you doing? I know you got a trip coming up as well. Man, things are good. Can't complain. Full swing in the NHL season. Uh, this week, like you said, like you alluded to, I'm going to New York. Uh, so excited to check out the Rangers at MSG. And oh, yeah. obviously, it'll be awesome to see them play the Leafs there. Uh, my first time ever in New York. So really looking forward to that with the girlfriend and going to make some good memories and kick off a good holiday season. But Let's not bury the lead, buddy. Like you said, James Duthie coming aboard. I mean, that's a that's a huge get, and that's awesome for the HTH pod. Oh, yeah. Everybody, I hope you enjoy the James Duthie interview we got going on later. Yeah, and we'll say right off the bat. Like, obviously, guys, go. If you haven't checked out Duthie's pod or book, like when he comes on, we'll intro it fully. But uh, obviously, got to give huge respects to a guy that's coming on and even a guy for both of us, like inspiration in the sport media landscape. So uh, definitely looking forward to chatting with him. But Lucas, just to start it off, so – Obviously, it's always the running joke, TSN, Toronto sports. <laughs> um, the Leafs are the storyline. I mean, we got we to gotta open it up. It, regardless of what you want to say right now, like there's obviously other storylines around the league. But Marner, as we're recording right now, the point streak is still going. And the Leafs are on a roll right now. And you know what? I look like a, I look like a dummy. I mean, that's not the first time on this pod. I mean, I was on like on it right away with all these haters on Twitter being like, no Riley, no Brody. This is going to be a mess. And in some games, it's shown, and Matt Maurice had to stand on his head. But, man, like Justin Hall on the top pair, and the Leafs are still rolling. Like, Lucas, man, how like, Buddy, how are you even feeling on this? <laughs> man, we pushed the panic button a few weeks ago when Riley got hurt, eh, without Riley and Brody. Yeah. And, I mean, you can't really fault us. Like, losing your two best defensemen, it, it should have a trickle-down effect that, you know, uh, requires – defensemen that are your five, six guys and guys who are your six, seven guys to play bigger minutes. And they've done that. And they've somehow really worked well here. I mean, Sandine and Lilligren, lots of credits got to go to them. Oh, big uh, time for really filling those. Even shoes that, well. man, even that stars game, seeing Sandine and Lilligren on a five, one, three PK, like unreal. That, that was one of those, man, that was one of those moments in like a season that like can really get your guys like going for a yeah. few weeks of a, of a big stretch. And like, I feel like the momentum's just continued from that, but even like Giordano, like oh. I think, I think people forget like how good this guy is even He's at so his good. age. Right. Man, like, like the thing is, is like the only thing I could possibly point out in Giordano's game right now is just his like speed. He's slow. Right. Yeah. Foot, and, foot and that's speed. His, his foot speed. That's it yeah. though, bro. Like across the board. And like, you could see it in the guy, like sometimes it'll be 40, 50 seconds on a shift and he'll be like, out of breath racing to the bench but outside yeah. of that man when he's actually in like the zone when he's on coverage like the guy's a beast man we're talking about a guy that's like almost 40 or 40 like he's right there and it's just like yeah. unreal but yeah man i matt murray just different level and bro i i love all the haters too we're talking about haters of riley talk about haters of matt murray bro i'm seeing like i actually respect penguins fans that throw respect sense fans man get out of here this guy has one poor game where the least still win the Leafs still win the game and Sens fans are on Matt Murray. Bro, throw that Calgary game out the window. Matt Murray's been unreal. One of the best goalies in the league in the last Oh yeah, years. one of the best. One of the best. And I I I like you said, like I feel like the Ottawa fans are looking for him to fall. Yeah. And they just want to jump on that, but the yeah. fact that we're 30 games in, I know he was hurt for the start of the season, but man, he has been one of the best goalies in the league when he's been in. Yeah. That game on Saturday, it makes you think like, wow, he didn't really have a great game. When have I ever felt that? When yeah, have I felt that, that at all this time? Year? Yeah, man, it's crazy. <laughs> and like, he still got the dub. The, the Leafs in general, it's like at the start of the season with the two goalies they brought in and Dubas took a big chance. I feel yeah. I feel like everyone was skeptical for good reason. Um, and I don't want to get too far ahead. Like in a month or two, it might be a little bit different than how we're talking right now. For sure. Uh, but man, they have been both those goaltenders. The fact that you have Samsonov back and you're not even like putting him in the net very often because Murray's just grabbed a hold of this crease. Uh, it's, it's a great thing to see. And I hope they still, you know, maybe a, a 60, 40 split is, is the way it should go for the rest yeah. of the way. If they're both healthy, but I think Murray is your starter, uh, clearly as of right now. Yeah. I would say in the new year, I mean, Hey, this is coming from a Matt Murray fantasy owner here. 
So this me is too, thing that me I'm too. This. Yeah, this me is the thing too. that I'm saying. Is I do think in the new year you need to start mixing in like Sam Sonoff stretches in there. So Murray, mm-hmm. like, kind of like again, I hate making it like a Toronto comparison here, but kind of like the Kawhi load management. Like, you know, you have this guy that can perform in the playoffs. Again, it's a bad comparison because like I'm not putting Murray in that top. But like what I'm saying is the guy has two cups. The guy's shown he can win in the playoffs. Load management, the guy. Obviously, you want him to go through the stretches where he's still confident in the spring, but. I've seen this version of Matt Murray Lucas right now. And I'm like, Oh my, I want this guy in the playoffs. Like I want this guy in this form in the playoffs. If it's he's insane. in this form, man, if he's in this form, this is the best, you know, goaltending performance they'll have had obviously in the playoffs. I mean, Jack Campbell had real big bright spots and so did Freddie Anderson. Yeah. Um, but in terms of consistency through games one to seven, we haven't seen it yet. And um, this is where like, yeah, sure. You can look at the Calgary game where he allowed a couple weak goals, but I think that's the big part of Campbell and Anderson. And I think even when we were talking back when Campbell was still here, it was like, that was your big criticism of Anderson. And it kind of backfired on you a little bit because Campbell did the same thing. Where it was like, you're making big saves and you're performing well over the series, but then those bad goals that just crunch you, like, it's not even like you're just garbage. Like that was never Freddie Anderson. He wasn't trash. He made crazy saves against Boston, crazy saves against Columbus. Same thing with Campbell, man. He may, he was not the problem in either of those series in the, in its entirety. It was mm-hmm, just those mm-hmm. weak goals. Whether you look at Anderson, the goal uh, from Liam Foody, or the Campbell Sean goal, yeah, or the yeah the Campbell goal against uh, Brendan Gallagher, or like yeah, or like some of those goals that just stand out to you, where it's like that's got to be a save, and mm-hmm. it just crushes you. And I just think I see the signs. I'm not gonna wouldn't say this, but it's like Matt Murray. I just haven't seen that from him outside of that like that Calgary game. Like he just doesn't do that. Um, but again, it's the season, man. And this is where I go when people get honest, sorry, I'm going through a long stretch here, but it's like when people get honest for the reactions early on in that California road trip and all that stuff, it's not about the current state of the season. It's about remembering all these playoff failures and going, wow, this is what we see from this team. There's no chance. Honestly, maybe I'm going too hard, like hard on expectations, but like, this is basically what I expect from the Leafs, this Leafs team. Oh yeah. They Basically. should be right, man. They should be right up there challenging for the president's trophy. I, they have the talent to do it. Right? Yeah. And I mean, do I expect Mitch Marner to be doing this? No, he's going on a crazy level. Do I, did I expect Matt Murray to be this good? No, but in its entirety, I expect the Leafs to easily be in the top three of this division, like mm-hmm. based on skill. Sorry, I'll let yeah. you go, bro. I just want to know. No, no ab- <laughs> absolutely, man. And they should, they should be like concretely in a spot where they have home ice. I mean, that's, That is the caliber of players this team has. That is the team Dubas has assembled. Anything below that is a bit of a disappointment in the season. And this is where the whole conversation comes around where does the regular season matter to the Leafs and to their fans, right? Every year, I feel like we have to go through this because everyone's just waiting for April. And no, truthfully, every year we reset and it does matter. It creates confidence. It it builds on uh, big moments for new players like these goaltenders. I think this Mitch Marner stretch, and I alluded to it on the last pod too, him having this massive stretch on this point run is really big for his confidence when things get tough because yeah. inevitably it's going to happen to him and he's yeah. going to be able to reflect and look back and go, wow, I had a point streak upwards uh, of, of Patty Kane and Sidney Crosby's prime, right? I mean, this yeah. is really big for him. So, and Matthews is, is getting back into it with, with the goals. Um, you know, obviously he had the slow start, but uh, you Isn't know, it crazy that Nylander's matched with Matthews and points right now and, and, is he leading goals with the team now? Nylander has been, right? He's 17. Yeah, I think. yeah he, w- he would be now. And what was crazy was I think it was the Stars game. I want to say it was the Stars games on uh, on TSN. So bringing this all back around to Dutty, they had the quiz on there. And they had to rank, I believe it was. The, or you know what? It was either that or it was. It no, they were that. ranking how they would finish in point totals in the in season. In point totals, in point totals. Anyways, and a couple the, of them had, I think. The core well, four. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, you know what I'll say on that too is like, Everyone forgets how good Nylander can be when he's consistent. And like, I mean, again, it's a short stretch. He just got on one of the stars of the week, like seven points in three games. That's like ridiculous. I do think people forget sometimes how good this core four can be. And there's a possibility, again, knock on wood, that this four guy, like all four guys could finish over a point per game. It's it's, it's really possible. It is. It is. And you know what? You're seeing it right now. I mean, you could argue right now, Matthews, Marner, and Nylander are firing at all cylinders, right? And Tavares is doing his job. And Tavares too, still has, I think, he's only like a point below per game. I think yeah, he's like right so, there. So, like, we've, I feel like a big thing with the Leafs is you never really see all four guys firing at one time because it yeah. doesn't necessarily have to be that way. As long as two or three of them are going, they're fine. Um, so, and what we've seen in the playoffs is for some reason, all four of them shut down. 
Uh, so oh, as man. Long- if all four yeah. of them are going in the playoffs, like that's not even a discussion, right? I know, man. They're one of the best teams in the league. If that if that is the case. Um, but yeah, they've really made this interesting with Boston. I'm, I'm always giving it to Chris, yeah. uh, f- fellow Bruins fan, uh, fan of the pod, three points back of Boston right now. I know Boston's got the two games in hand, but they've really started to get close here. Um, so I, I, I do think the Leafs are going to jump them. It's only a matter of time, especially if the Leafs can beat yeah. them in the head to head games. Right. Yeah. Uh, anyways. So I, I do, I, I just want to finish off that by saying, I do hate when people say like, Oh, Leaf fans were reacting a certain way or the California trip. Oh, blah, blah, blah. Bro, it's I don't know how that's like a surprise or how that's unwarranted. Like that this team should never be in that conversation. So I just wanted to put that in there as like great. I, I'm loving what I'm watching. Even I wanted to make the point of saying, and I said this on Twitter, not even just Marner's point streak. Like the guys, like the Leafs are up by three goals, and this guy's going for a, a full ice back check. Like end of the shift, full ice back check. The Leafs are up by a few goals, and he's still doing that with a couple minutes ago. Like that's the signs you want from this team. And again, that's why I've said so many times in certain guys, even when Nylander gets on my nerves sometimes, it's like the Sunday skates, like that can't fly in the playoffs. And you don't see that from Tampa. You don't see that from like the cores of Pittsburgh and all these championship teams. So I just wanted to make that point as well. All right. So Leafs buzzing. We had to open it up because if you're watching the NHL these days, like the Leafs got to be a storyline. I don't care what kind of biases you want to say are happening here. (laughs) The Leafs are the biggest storyline probably in the Atlantic division right now in a positive sense outside mm-hmm. of the Bruins, but they've been a storyline the whole year. Um, outside of that, I would say let's talk about um, a couple teams that we've been like disappointed in. Um, I do want to start talking about the Florida Panthers in the sense that I think there's a real chance. And based on the last part, we talked about it. Like I kind of, I didn't call Detroit frauds, but I was kind of like they could fall out, but they've, they've still been playing pretty well. Mm-hmm. I even think with like Tampa right there and these Metro teams being such a tight race, like Rangers, Islanders, Penguins, Capitals are on a four game win streak right now. All those Metro teams battling for the wild card. <laughs> Luke is like that Florida trade, man. And if they miss the playoffs and all those assets they give up, I, I just wanted to talk about that Atlantic division because it's like all these teams performing above. And I, I do want to, again, a little job of the sense. Remember the conversation before the year, the core four versus core four, all that stuff. Yeah, Atlantic yeah. division chat here, Lucas. What's yeah. surprising you the most? Is it Florida? I'd say it has to be Florida. I think that, you know, as a, they won the president's trophy last year, right? Um, so they were right at the top of the league. And and this trade as of right now, hasn't fared well uh, for both teams, you know, two months into it. Kachuk personally has been good. I mean, yeah, Kachuk has been good, but team yeah. success wise. And I yeah. know Barkov ha- has missed some time as well. And that's always important to know, but, but Florida is really seeing like they're having, uh, you know, even goaltending issues as well. Uh, it, it seems like it was only a matter of time before Spencer Knight took the cage. And they're giving him yeah. more of that leash now. So there's going to be a learning curve for him there as a, as a 1A. And he's struggled uh, a couple of games too, even in that stretch. Yeah, yeah he really has. And and Bobrovsky, I think it's it's just a matter of time for him to, you know, his, his game to fall off a bit. And he always has been that Jekyll and Hyde goalie where it's like one year he's really good, one year he's fallen. So I think that's a lot of it is is the goaltending. And their blue line is just not very good. I mean, that, there's no secret in that. When you lose um, Mackenzie Weger. When Aaron Eckblad was hurt for for a while there, um, remind me, John. There's somebody else they're missing, but the the Panthers in general, like their blue line uh, as a whole, I don't think is built for the top end of the Atlantic Division. Uh, when you got teams like Boston, Toronto, and Tampa, yeah. Well, there. that's why there's been the rumors of like the Panthers going for Eric Carlson. But yeah, like if you're looking yeah. at the Panthers core right now, it's like so you have Eckblad, Montour, and Forsling, mm-hmm. who are your like yeah. your motor. But after that, it's like that's what people talk about. It's like Gudis. I think he's day to day right now. Like he's, yeah, he's physical, but it's like Mark, Mark Stahl. Stahl. And then like, yeah, it's just, I, they, yeah, they've lost the motors in a, in a way. Like, I just feel like the Panthers didn't get significantly worse in my opinion, but I just think if you look at the Panthers identity, like a lot mm-hmm. of that was Huberto and a mm-hmm. lot of, and Huberto, I just feel like has lost his identity a little bit. Like he's still showing signs in Calgary, but it's like, I think his identity has always been in Florida. And yeah, I mean, you're right. Like Uyghurs even lost his like kind of stride a bit in Calgary. And it's like, he had such a fit. And I think Montour has kind of taken that role. But yeah, man, I think the two teams that a lot of people were looking at this year in terms of like shift in Atlantic is Florida and Ottawa. And I think some people had Florida missing, but like Ottawa taking their spot, not Detroit. So I think there's been kind of surprising there or surprises there. But 
Yeah, man. I, I think looking at that Metro division, it's going to be so intriguing because the Caps have kind of, in a weird way, and we just talked about goaltending last week, Darcy Kemper's been injured and Charlie Lindgren's taken over and the Caps on a four game winning streak. They just knocked the Jets off who were on a winning streak. So I'm looking at that Metro, man. It's like, if I'm some of these teams in the Atlantic, I am really worried. And even if I'm Tampa Bay, I don't think I'd ever be saying Tampa Bay should be worried, but I'd be a little worried. I like just based on the fact that if Detroit keeps like sticking around and mm-hmm. if the Panthers can somehow turn it around, like there's going to be a decent team or a really good team in the Atlantic that misses the playoffs. And I'll even look at the standings right now and just say, if I'm looking at the Rangers too, they have so much pressure on them to make the playoffs. And like, they were even talking about like the Patrick Kane trade rumors. They're not trading for Patrick Kane. If they don't start winning games, it's like the caps are now up to 32 points. Like the lightning, I think they've won a couple of games recently. So they're back in that third division spot, three points ahead of the Red Wings. But it's like the Caps, third last in the Metro are top or are two points now ahead of the Panthers. Um, so it's just like there's there's gotta be a situation here where one of these Atlantic teams probably drops off as a seller at some point. Um, I just can't see how Ottawa turns it around at this point, even with Josh Norris out. I, I just don't see it. Yeah. And like, as of right now, it's shaping out. You don't really see this too often where it's going to be a, you know, as of right now, it's shaping out as a five teams coming out of the Metro and three under the Atlantic. Right. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, that, that's the way it's shaking Florida, Florida, just with the Huberto comment you made, I think that's a, a really, you know, I, I agree with that. I think Jonathan Huberto, a lot of his identity, everything about him was a Florida Panther. And I think that he was so used to playing that like East West high flying offense type yeah. of game in Florida. It, it's just going to take him so long to adjust and get used to the North. Well, that South, was the that concern Sutter for place. sure. Yeah. yeah. And, and you're seeing it. And even with Florida's team success, I think that regardless if Kachuk is having individual success, I think Huberto was very, very important to the fabric of that locker room. And, and had a lot of good friends on the team. He was there for so long. So it's just, it really hasn't worked out two months in for either of the teams on a team level. Uh, yeah. Calgary too is just so disappointing. I know we're talking mostly Eastern conference right now, but just so disappointing to see uh, them fall off, especially when a lot of people had them near the top of their division. So, yeah, well, I, Panthers are a good subject and a comparison on this other team. And uh, I know you watched them quite a bit. So I just want to ask you, are you tossing the towel on the blue season yet? Cause it's again, since the last pod, man, it's, Oh, he's repping. He's repping because here's what I'll say. I'll just say quickly before you throw your opinion. And I, and I, I don't know that you want to have the optimism here, but it's like, you're looking at a situation now where the set, the top end of the central has been so heavy with the jets and stars and the abs have been like mediocre and still in that third division spot. Like, I just feel like the cushion there is, I don't know if I, if I'm a blues fan or if I'm looking at it from an organizational standpoint, um, I think there's gonna be so much more points to be grabbed in that Pacific division. And that's where I also want to say, it's kind of funny. I think I was talking to my dad and he was, we were watching the, obviously the Leafs Kings game yeah, and just the Kings looking like frauds in that game. <laughs> and I think it was also like that week, the, well, the Kraken actually just beat the Panthers last night or a couple of nights ago. I think it was yesterday. Uh, but the Panthers had beat the Kraken five, one. And we were talking about the Pacific division and my dad was talk- like assuming Calgary and Edmonton were in the top three. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, no, LA and the Kraken are there. <laughs> like, it's just, it's, it's kind of funny just how some of these like stands have worked out. So for you, um, Calgary, St. Louis, like talking about the same situation as Florida, I would say in terms of like expectations, are you tossing the towel on some of these teams? Like Calgary? I mean, they could still do it because the Pacific's so weak, mm-hmm. but like St. Louis, man, are, are you worried? Oh, I'm very worried. Um, uh, <laughs> I am very, very worried. My tune has changed dramatically in these last few weeks. Um, I see the blues as like, you know, the most recent memory to us is yesterday. They played the avalanche and the avalanche are obviously running six or seven AHLers out there right now. Yeah. Um, they're pretty beat up so many injuries and they and still Francis lose to them. Playing. Yeah. And they still lose to them. Right. Yeah. Um, and they were winning the game. The other thing is too, you got to look at how the game unfolds. And with the Blues winning 2-1 and blowing the lead with eight seconds left, like that is one of those losses that's just like, you feel you feel it, I feel like. I, as an athlete, you're thinking, yeah. man, if we couldn't win that one, especially with eight seconds left, we couldn't close the door on that one. Like, are we ever going to win a game? Um, so I think St. Louis is in big, big trouble right now. I was talking to uh, a family friend about them, and 
yeah, he he essentially thinks throw in the towel, um, make the moves, make the moves and call it call it a day. I think they have a slight chance of getting a wild card if they can somehow write the ship. But yeah. the top three, like you said, John, are over, in my opinion, because Winnipeg and Dallas are so far high with that cushion. And if Colorado can just coast at about 500 hockey until they yeah. get people back, Colorado's going to run away too. So, uh, yeah, I think yeah. at this point, like there would have to be some dramatic fall for either of the Jets or Stars to fall out. A yeah. Dramatic fall. Dramatic. And and, and St. Louis also is, is at a time right now where they've given these contracts to Kyrou and Thomas. And I know we've talked about it, but they could almost do sort of a retool on the fly and make a few moves, um, you know, big moves to their core as far as O'Reilly, Tarasenko, those guys go. Yeah. Um, and I know a lot of fans are calling for Pareko's head right now uh, as their number one D man. He's really not had a good start to the season, but uh, they're definitely going to have to make some big moves if it keeps going this way. And I, I probably give him another week uh, of Barube's job. If honestly, if he loses a couple wow. more in a row, right? Like it, it's getting there. Yeah. It's really getting there right now. Yeah. I think there's a lot of different things probably happening there. And I, I mean, yeah, I mean, we're about to talk about this, this big trade conversation again, and I've kind of delayed it a bit because I hate making this a Canuck show, but <laughs> it's again, it's a conversation, but it's like, it's talking about those certain teams, man. Like you get into that certain spot and you really have to start making those hard decisions. And for the blues, it's probably Tarasenko and O'Reilly. Like those are mm-hmm. the two guys I look at. It's like, you can go down the list with other guys like a Barbashev or whoever, but it's like, I look at Tarasenko and O'Reilly and it's like, you have to get that value. If you're going to be out of a playoff conversation, you have to get that value. Obviously, there's been so many discussions about Tarasenko trades for so long and him wanting out. So that's probably where you have to get the value. If O'Reilly wants to retire a blue, I guess you could probably make that happen because Con uh, Smythe, Stanley Cup champion, all that good stuff. So uh, yeah, certain trades, certain value. Let's discuss it, Lucas. I, again, we talk about the Canucks every week, but it's just the reality of the situation, man. They're... If we want to talk about one of the most positive storylines in recent weeks, the Leafs have been one of them. And one of the more negative storylines has been the Canucks. So uh, Rick Dollywall comes out today and says, hearing the Canucks made an offer to Bo Horvat, and I did watch the clip, and it seems like it was one of those final contract offers or like at least significant ones until the trade deadline kind of gets into full swing. And Bo mm-hmm. Horvat's camp rejected it. Uh, he thinks it came in slightly below $8 million, and the Canucks do not want to go over $8 million. Uh, for a guy at his age and he's having a point per over a point per game start. So it even kind of inflates that amount. And LeBron adds to that report and goes told that the Canucks made Horvat's camp, the new contract offer within the last couple of weeks offer rejected. And now the Canucks are fully focused on the trade market between now and March 3rd trade deadline. So that's the Canucks mindset. Like it is completely shifted. And now the conversation is, is the regret to a full, like, I don't know, amount with that JT Miller decision. And now like even more so is like, you're trying to sign guys like Kuzmenko next year and all these certain decisions. So Lucas, man, do you believe that Bo Horvat will be traded? Brock Besser, both. What do you like? Again, it's a new updated show here, but I actually uh, this think this just both. came out today. This just came yeah. out today. John, I think it's both, man. I think Brock Besser, the writings on the wall. We talked about that last week. Um, as far as Bo Horvat goes after this deal, like, Vancouver's stretching as far as they can given their circumstance and it's yeah. such a it's such a shame like for Canucks fans it's truly a shame because yeah. you would have had that extra wiggle room if you didn't sign JT Miller I don't know how many times we got to say sure, it yeah. um and JT Miller got eight right and Rupe Hintz last week got 8.45 or something like that so you're Bo Horvat deserves at least that Rupe Hintz number if not more yeah. Uh, in my opinion, the value he brings, the captain he is, the leader he is, all the things that he does on the ice, um, the, what he means to the Canucks fans and the community there. Being the guy, like we talked about last week, that was here when this project start, started to get revamped post Sedins. Um, yeah, it's going to be, it's such a shame that they're they're going to lose this guy. They're going to have to trade him because like you said, like we were talking about with O'Reilly and Tarasenko, you got to get the value and, and you got to, obviously more so in this case, but they got to get hard pieces back that fans can at least gravitate towards. Cause this is, yeah. this is going to be sad if they don't get a proper return here. Yeah. I would, I would agree on the current value. The only thing I'd kind of do a devil's advocate on is just like the longer term value. So him being just a few years older than like a guy like hints and yep. guys like Larkin and stuff like that. So just the longer term vision, but it's like, they just signed JT Miller to the max. So it's like, they really didn't have that vision uh, to begin with, but yeah, I mean, if you look at the situation with Brock Bess, uh, with Brock Besser, a couple of years left, like they won't get much value back in that. Uh, but the more, Hor- yeah, the more Horvat one, they should get major value. Rick Dollywall kind of pointed out that they're going to be looking for a draft pick. So I'm assuming a first round pick. 
a younger defenseman, preferably right shot, and then a younger center. So if you can get that, I think if you're the Canucks, you have to go for it. Trade, Try to trade Besser, try to trade Garland, uh, create that flexibility. And there's also been rumors that they've been constantly asking OEL, Oliver ekman Larson to waive his no-movement clause, and that's just not happening. Because, I mean, if you guys remember, once upon a time, uh, he was getting traded from Arizona, and for some reason, he was strictly saying, I am only going to Boston or Vancouver. Yep, yep. So unless that. Boston starts calling, <laughs> I guess that's probably not happening. So one bomb that's been dropped recently is that the Canucks might be buying out one or two guys this offseason, and those two candidates for me are right, right in my face, <laughs> OEL and Tyler Myers. So um, we'll also see on that front. But Thatcher Demko out, Spencer Martin's taking the reins. I mean, there's so many things that have, have happened with the Canucks that are just so unpredictable. And so, I mean, predictable in a Vancouver Canucks way, but unpredictable in a, it's like Demko's been bad your captain's about to be gone in a few months potentially. And yeah, I just, I don't even know what's going on. <laughs> it's, it's just wild out there, man. Like, did you see the, uh, there was also the Bruce Boudreau comments a few days back when they asked him at the end of the game, uh, I forget what game it was, but they had, they were asked why he didn't pull the goalie. And he said, I just didn't feel like we were going to score tonight. Like, like that's how down bad it's getting there, man. It's getting so down bad. Like, Jeez. I could not have predicted Vancouver would be in this much of a down bad zone. I really yeah. couldn't have. Uh, and especially when they're one of the biggest hockey markets and loudest media markets, it's just, it just gets worse. Um, so uh, yeah. Fun fact on the Bo Horvat thing though. I mean, obviously he was traded for, they acquired that draft pick in the Corey Schneider deal. Right. So this Corey yeah. Schneider trade will keep going and we'll see what it turns into if they do deal him. Yeah. The trade, yeah. that'll be interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah so Overall, guys, I, I do hope everyone watching and listening, you just accept the fact that there's probably going to be five or 10 minutes dedicated to the Vancouver Canucks in the coming weeks of the pod because it's just the reality of the situation. Uh, just some quick hits. Uh, I'll just rip through them, and then we could talk about a couple other things before we bring on the legend, James Duffy. Uh, Chicker, an update. He's been unreal since returning from injury. Now the Coyotes are looking for two first plus a second plus a pro. Like, it's insane what they're looking for. It's so unrealistic. Uh, and the Patrick Kane update. Uh, the Blackhawks will be meeting with Patrick Kane and Johnny Taves in the new year to discuss where they're at. And it was on NHL Network. Friedman was talking about it, that his whole mindset was like, sure. Because we had Versteeg on. I remember Versteeg was saying that mm-hmm. if he was Patrick Kane, he'd want to go to a new team in the season. But the mindset apparently with Patrick Kane is he's wanted to wait, not because he wants that extra like leeway. He just wants to know which good, like which teams are good. <laughs> essentially. Yeah. Like he didn't want a chance. Jump. Yeah. He didn't want to jump yeah. into a team at the start of the year and that team be garbage. Right. Mm-hmm, so it's mm-hmm. like that, that's the exact scenario we're seeing with the Rangers right now is like, maybe he would have been a Ranger at the start of the year, but he's probably looking at the situation now. He's like, uh, like they're yeah. very on the borderline. It's like Patrick Kane going to that is not going to jumpstart them to the top of the Metro. So I think for Patrick Kane, Johnny Tabes, I would expect one of them to be dealt, but obviously Patty Kane, if he stayed with the Hawks for another couple of years, he could start breaking records. So that part's interesting. Uh, Just quickly, Lucas, I know we talked about this a few weeks ago. I just want to revisit the conversation. Connor Bedard, let's let's just quickly chat with World Juniors because we can touch on it with Duffy uh, because World Juniors is coming up again. It just seems like we just had it. Uh, Connor Bedard, if that's your first overall pick still, where do you want him to go as your new updated pick or where you see him likely? Because the Jackets, the rumors right now are that they are standing pat on the season. They know it's rough. Even signing Johnny Gaudreau, they know it's going downhill and they're looking forward to the 2023 draft. Imagine Connor Bedard in between potentially lining Gaudreau long-term. Uh, what other opportunities do you see Bedard and likely opportunities? Yeah, Columbus, that's cool. That would be like a Rick Nash vibe there too, uh, as yeah. a first overall pick. But for me... I would like to see, uh, you know, I'd like to see the Coyotes get him just to kind of revamp. Really? That mar- yeah, man. For that market, I think it would be cool. I know it's it's a tough sell seeing you, the number one overall pick in a barn. Um, that's you know. Oh man, it'd be barn. electric, but though. but it would be sick, right? And I think that it would it would generate buzz before they do move. So I like that yeah. one. I like San Jose because I just like the whole California appeal to it. Yeah. Uh, so you you can even throw Anaheim in there for that. Um, and I I like the Blues if they just blow it up. I like the blues if they really want to blow it up and tank. I mean, they're right. They could be in there too. Right. Yeah. Um, definitely am not crazy about Chicago because of the success they've had. I think they deserve mm-hmm. to sit this one out and not crazy about Philly. Cause I don't know how torts would do if he was still there uh, starting Bedard's career. 
Yeah, I think my two favorites that I want to see is well, the yeah, Arizona, I guess, would create the storylines. I'm saying San Jose and Columbus, I'm still kind of with, but the one hot take team that, again, if they somehow slipped, it'd be really intriguing to me. And we just talked about it, but I, I just don't see it. It'd be one of those like crazy outcomes. Uh, would be like one of those teams in the Atlantic, like of a, a Florida, because then it would just create so much storyline in that Atlantic, just in terms of like the top centers. What about Again, Ottawa, too? Yeah. Oh, oh I, uh, oh man. Bedard versus bad. Matthews, but that'd be bad. In Battle of Ontario. Yeah. I guess, I mean, Ottawa's possible with how it is. I, I was going with the hot take. I don't see Florida dropping that much, but Ottawa, I guess, is realistic. But uh, that matchup would be nuts. That'd make the Battle of Ontario so competitive. I oh, mean, it yeah, has man. gotten more competitive, but just Bedard. Stutzla and Norris up the middle. I, I mean, I'm sh- I'm sure they'd they'd shift one of them to the wing. I'm yeah, sure. Stutzla probably goes to the wing. I feel like that happens. Yeah, yeah. Uh, World Juniors, man. Are you uh, more so looking forward to it than the summer version? I mean, I'm just looking at Canada's top six. Let, let's just rip it quickly. Is like Bedard, Fantilli, Stankoven, Dylan Gunther, Shane Wright, Brendan Offman. Like, are you excited, man, or what? Man, I'm amped up for this. I'm amped up for this. Listen, I will say, you, when you're growing up in Canada as a kid. It's all about the world juniors and, you know, just growing into adulthood. I feel like I haven't been as invested in it over the years, uh, especially the summer one. I mean, it's just tough to get into it during the summer. Yeah, yeah. This, this year though, man, the team they got, like, I know every year it's gold or bust, but this year, man, with the team, they got Stan Coven, our boy, pod boy, yeah. he's going to put, he's going to be great on this team. Uh, Kent Johnson on there. Is Kent Johnson going to be on there? No, no, he's saying Columbus. they won't send him down. Okay, but th- who's the other guy? There was another guy in Columbus that I was thinking. I think they might send him down. Um, Shane Wright's going, right? Shane Wright's yeah, going. Wright's gonna be there. So, man, they're gonna have a good team. Regardless, they're gonna have a really, really good team, and I- I'm excited to see it. I'm really excited. To yeah, see just it. to say, I don't think Kent Johnson. Uh, yeah, I want to say I don't. I think his eligibility just ended. I don't think okay. he would have been eligible for this World Juniors. I think he was only eligible for the summer one because it got shifted. Mm-hmm. Um. Mm-hmm. But yeah, Columbus missed out on a couple. But I'm trying to think, like, I think for the Jackets, um, I think, well, they had a bunch of guys just eligible, but I'm trying to think. I don't think they had anyone. I guess, yeah, Sillinger, I think, is 22 now. Yeah. Actually, no, I know. Sillinger Sillinger would have been the one eligible to go to Team USA, but they're keeping him. Okay. That's who it was because he's still 19. Um, But yeah, man, honestly, I'm – yeah, even USA should be interesting uh, storylines. But yeah, Canada's just on a different uh, level up front, at least. Uh, they always have the goaltending question mark, but up front, they're uh, they're going to be electric. But yeah, oh, man, yeah. just to wrap and go into the Duffy uh, chat, anything else to kind of point out here before we talk to James and anything uh, I guess maybe you might chat with him about? Like, I'm thinking, man, we got to chat with him about his trip to the World Cup. World absolutely, chat, hockey. absolutely. Hockey chats, uh, just, you know, Duffy's you know, how he, uh, you know, started his career and really took those steps uh, early on to to get where he's ended up on TSN as just like, he's been there forever, man. I, yeah. I can't remember TSN without Dutty. So uh, yeah. and that's, that's a compliment. That's a huge compliment. Oh, so huge. Uh, yeah, I've always, thinking about TSN hockey, uh, love it or hate it, you guys always see Dutty out there. So respects to the guy. Um, but yeah, I mean, both of us, man, going into some World Cup chat might bring out some negative feels man still down bad about portugal down bad man we'll have to probably keep it to the canada to the canada world cup chat just to uh bounce that off duthy and then you know stay positive because canada although they didn't win uh any games group of death yeah the group of death and they really showed themselves on the international stage so good for them good for them they they uh they did well uh last thing actually do you uh final four do you have a pick for who's gonna win we can ask we can we can ask duthy as well Okay, who do I think is going to get there? I think it's going to be Argentina and France. Who do I want it to be? I want it to be Croatia, Morocco for the banter, <laughs> just for the group of death banter. Just, and just it's fun, man. Like yeah. put two teams there that haven't won before. I know it's not like great for ratings necessarily because Messi isn't in it, but um, yeah, that would be fun just to see a new team win the World Cup. What about you? Oh, I hope I'm proven wrong, but I think everyone was like talking about like this script or this potential of Ronaldo versus Messi, and I'm just like. Folks, the script was written. Everyone wanted to see Mbappe versus Messi, yo. Like, it's mm. it's good. I want to be proven wrong. I want to be proven wrong. Mbappe is going to leave PSG. All this banter, all this debate's happening. And, like, everyone's talking about Mbappe being one of the best players in the world coming up. Messi being the best with Ronaldo. And it's like, I don't know, man. The Ronaldo hate's going strong still. 
guys gone through a tough year. People just want to hate on them. And I mean, Hey, I, I, I hope I'm proven wrong. I think Mess- Messi, Argentina are going to win. They just, everyone wants it so bad. They want no, it so no. bad. No, no, please. No. Ron's the goat. Don't forget it. All right. Let's All bring right. on the legend, James Duffy. Hey everyone, we're back with the Hot Take Hockey Podcast. We got a legend on the show, James Duffy, longtime host and personality on TSN, uh, also an author and host on the Rubber Boots Podcast. Uh, James, we know you just got back from the World Cup. How are you doing? How is everything? And uh, we really appreciate you coming on. Oh, thank you guys for having me, John Lucas. Uh, I'm good. I was, I was, I, I got sick. Uh, like everybody's got this Qatari kind of flu. When we come home, which I don't know if it's an actual thing or it's just you know how sometime you're when you're working hard on something whether it's school or work and your immune system kind of carries you through it right i'm at the world yep, I yep. Sick while i'm working and it's so as soon as you get home uh almost everybody on my crew that's that's gotten home has been sick so i've been fighting that for about eight or nine days but it was a really really cool experience like that was one thing that was on uh on my bucket list for a long time and uh to to have canada make it this time and uh, to be able to be in those stadiums uh, for the Canada games was pretty spectacular. Yeah. I can't even imagine. That's awesome. So both of our backgrounds are Portuguese. So we've always been highly invested in, in the Euro and in the world cup, but to right. see Canada there was just so special. Um, and to, Insane, to really cheer yeah. for the country we're born in and, and grew up in is unbelievable. So my, my wife's always been uh, invested in the Portuguese too, because she likes how good they look. <laughs> There you go. There you yeah, go. I was listening to your podcast a bit. So your wife was there for a few days. Yeah, well. she came first. Uh, Brooksy came for the first uh, week, basically. So she came. I, I got there maybe a week before, and she stayed for the first Canada game, and then and then went home. But she got to see a lot more of Qatar than I did because we work so much. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're every day. You're either training or at the games or whatever. But uh, uh, yeah, she. Uh, you should have her on. She'd tell you a lot more about Qatar. Than that's really any, cool. Yeah. Any any big highlight you want to circle in on from the Qatar experience? I know the Alfonso Davies goal has got to be up there, but anything. Yeah, well, uh, yeah. That, would, that would be it. And the first the first game I think was really special. Like to me, I might even remember that more. Mm-hmm. Uh, just the guys singing the anthem, you know, and just uh, I always love the anthems before World Cups because everybody sings, but the Canadians in particular yeah. really belting it out and. Uh, you know, there was tears coming down the faces of a couple of guys. And I, I was ta- I remember I was taping it. I might have posted something on Instagram or something, but uh, I didn't even realize I was singing while I was taping. I was just like, the moment kind of got to me. And I was mm-hmm. belted out too. So that was that was really cool. And you're right, the Davies goal. I think I said this uh, maybe on our podcast, but, uh, you know, you, you're trained in journalism as you guys would know that you're, you're not supposed to cheer in the press box right yeah. and and i've been very good at that my entire career because it was very ingrained in me from journalism school but that mm-hmm. particular moment that right there because it was so shocking how quickly it came two minutes in and puffy who's a producer of ours who's on my podcast if you listen to the rubber boots podcast and uh i we just kind of like jumped up and down in each other's arms it was really embarrassing because <laughs> i don't know i was just so shocked by the moment and so it, w- it was so cool that it happened uh, so early into a game like that. So, yeah, those those two were the things that I'll never forget. And overall, I guess, did you, were, like, were there a lot of Canadian fans that either came up to you or, like, recognized you right off the bat? Because, like, James, got to give you a big credit. Like, it, I can I can only imagine, like, obviously, I think – all of Canada recognizes you the most with hockey and, and, and TSN through hockey, but your golf now, now soccer, uh, were a lot of people coming up to you in, in Qatar as well, or just chatting with Canadians. Yeah, for sure. Uh, but I, you know, no different for me than like, you know, Luke Wildman and, uh, yeah. Caldwell and all the soccer guys, of course. Uh, uh, so yeah, everybody for sure. Um, you know, what was cool to me was, I think you, I maybe I didn't fully appreciate how world football fans really know everyone. Like Julian de Guzman, you know, he was getting recognized by fans from Brazil and Argentina. Wow. And to me, that that's pretty cool. And uh, Kilban, you know, played for Ireland in the World Cup in 2002. Yeah. And uh, 
after that uh, Croatia game, there, there's one Irish pub called Shamrocks in, in Qatar. <laughs> and we went there and there's a group of about 10 of us. And uh, uh, there was no room in the pub. But the owner came out. And he's like, sorry, guys, there's no room. And then he goes, wait a second. Are you Kevin Kilban? <laughs> <laughs> he basically took, took us in the cub and kicked uh, into the pub and took, kicked the group at <laughs> their table because uh, this Irish legend was there. So uh, to me, that was the cool part. The people that recognized Stephen Caldwell and Kilban and De Guzman and to St. Ricketts and even Janine Becky. Yeah. You know, people respect international footballers. Mm-hmm. And I, I thought that was really cool. That's awesome. That's awesome. That is sweet. I mean, sticking to the uh, to the point of your bucket list, and and obviously the World Cup just being like the pinnacle of of sporting events, really, like right up there with the Olympics. Um, can you highlight any other really big moments that to that level for you uh, throughout your career, throughout your like long tenured career here, um, that you felt that way, similar to the World Cup, that it was just very special. Yeah, Lucas, like I, I, I said somewhere along the way, I got to do my own like little top 10, but mm-hmm. uh, there's certainly a few that, that stick out and they're they're all over the map. Like, it's funny, hockey, there's been so many, I've done so many Stanley Cup finals and World Juniors and such that they, they kind of blend together to an extent. Uh, I think some of the World Junior moments, like the Everly goal in Ottawa in like 2008 or nine or whenever that was, mm-hmm. even the one last summer was pretty cool in Edmonton. Um, yeah with McTavish hitting the puck off the goal line. But for me, like number one is probably always going to be the 2010 Olympics. I was a, an Olympic freak and to, to be able to host the Olympics in our own country was amazing. I would host during the day with Lisa LaFlamme, the former CTV news anchor. And then I'd go down and do the hockey games at night from the rink and uh, to be there for the Crosby goal. Uh, that's pretty hard to top. Um, but right up there, they're like covering the Raptors run to world championship uh you know i was in oakland sitting next to chris bosh when the when the raptors won the title that's up there for me uh and little things you know early in my career my second year at tsn i was uh i hosted nba a lot of people don't remember that and i was at the slam dunk contest in oakland where vince carter went off and you know that was you know that match a world cup or a championship or an olympic gold medal game but the atmosphere in that building was that I'll, I'll never forget it. Um, so those are some of them. And then, then there's a, you know, I've gotten fortunate enough to cover the Grey Cup. Uh, and this is a personal thing for me. My dad was dying uh, four or five years ago and uh, when the Red Blacks won the Grey Cup. And he's always been a big Ottawa football fan. So uh, to be up there on the stage presenting the Grey Cup to Ottawa and uh, knowing what that meant to my dad, that's that's an unforgettable moment as well. For you on a, kind of a sport media landscape, because we were also talking about it, uh, obviously for yourself, you've been in the game for so long. Uh, for me and Lucas kind of just dipping our toes a little bit. Uh, Lucas working for the NHL right now. And, and for myself uh, out of the program, like working full time, podcast, trying to get different things going, YouTube, and even I host for the Wolves on weekends. Do you feel like the change from when you started to now, like, do you feel like that gap is just to kind of an insane amount do you feel like even as your career even progresses more because even for yourself you've written a book books now and uh you have your podcast going like what's your mindset on that well yeah i you know you're right john like when when i started even in, when i was in journalism school you had to make a choice you either chose writing you chose radio or mm-hmm. you chose TV. Yeah. internet blogging and podcast none of that crap existed right yeah I remember in, in like last year, you sort of had to choose which one you wanted to, you know, major in or whatever. And I happened to choose TV. Um, but you're, but I, but I loved writing at the same time. And, uh, you know, yeah, nowadays you basically have to be able to do everything, right. The writers are on television, yeah. the guys write, uh, do podcasts, which is basically, you know, podcasting is essentially modern day radio. I think mm-hmm. the, so uh, it is it is a, a business where there's no there's hardly any specialization I think anymore that you, you and you guys are right and just getting your feet wet wherever you possibly can and doing yeah. whatever and it's funny because I you know I, I chose TV because I was pretty lazy in university and I thought in TV you'd have to do like a minute and a half story every week and in to in print you'd have to write 1500 words or something like that 
And I always thought, well, it's got to be easier to do 90 second TV story than to write 1500 words. Hmm. In actuality, <laughs> I kind of learned that it's harder. It's harder to actually yep. down than it is to expand on something. Yeah. But I was so glad that I was able to write. Uh, you know, I started writing columns for TSN.ca and uh, ended up writing a few books, as you mentioned. And I really missed writing. Uh, I like I, I didn't realize through maybe I did TV for 15 years or something like that without writing and then got back into writing. And I realized how much I missed writing. And the thing about writing, I mean, if you ever get a chance to write a book somewhere in your lives or there's a permanence to it. Right. Where something TV, it kind of, TV just kind of goes out into the air and it's gone. Like I'm never going to sit here in 20 years and talk about, Hey, Bob uh, McKenzie, remember that great uh, panel we did on the Leafs power play, right? That never happened. Yeah, yeah. But you, you write a book and it's kind of something your kids or your grandkids can read. And so uh, that's just a long winded way of saying that I, I have an appreciation of all of everything, even, even podcasts like this. I wish yeah. I have the one podcast I do with my buddies, but, I love podcasting. I think podcasting is a fantastic medium. Well, mm-hmm. you're so right about like the choosing different things. And obviously I know you know that way more than us, but even when I started uh, in the sport media program, 2017, I talking to professors and just seeing the transition and like, it was literally called like RTA radio television. Like, like it was such a vibe of like, you had to spit, like pick something specific. So audio or television or radio or writing, whatever, go down the list. But I think, yeah, everyone says it now to me, even when I talk to some of my former professors, it's like any opportunity you can get or any direction that can give you kind of that extra step or extra advantage over others, because it's such a tight, like the opportunities now are so tight and so difficult. So I think that's also a different perspective you want to get at any chance you can possibly get. And I obviously, I'm sure you've seen so many people come through TSN and having that exact mindset. Yeah. And you know, the one, the one thing some people say I know that not that you're looking for career advice or school advice, but, you know, I have some people that are, you know, pondering taking media courses or even older people like 30 years old that have, you know, been working for a few years and decide they want to go back and try media. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of people try to dissuade them and say, don't, you know, don't do it. Like it's a, it's a tough business right now. Right. Because it's Mm -hmm. shrinking and shrinking, but I, I, never be one to say that because you know how do I know that you know John or Lucas is not the next whoever right you know Rod Smith or uh, play-by-play Gord Miller or Chris Cuthbert whatever you want to be um and and people told me that back then like it was it was hard to get a job back in my time um because there weren't any sports networks yet it was just local sports and I remember I was doing news and uh, several people told me you should do not do not try to get into sports. Like that'll be a big mistake. And if I had to listen to them, you know, I'd still be covering murders or something in Ottawa. <laughs> so it's, uh, yeah. you know, if you have a passion for it, there's always going to be the need for good storytellers in the world. You should always have a backup plan for sure, because it is hard. You know, there's only so many jobs at TSN or Sportsnet or wherever, but, uh, man, if you have a passion for it, I, I couldn't imagine telling somebody not to go for it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my path is is similar where uh, in regards to I went to a media uh, a media program at the University of Guelph Humber. Mm. And a lot of people, you know, disencouraged me to get into sports because of the size of the business and, you know, just the amount of people that want to get into it. Um, but my thing was always, you know what, I'll I'll carve out my own path and have that backup plan beforehand. And if I, if I can pivot and find the opportunity, whenever it comes to me, I'm going to jump at it. And so that's essentially what happened to me when I graduated. I I worked at an agency, uh, put in a year there. Um, I even worked in a bit of automotive marketing for a little bit. Um, So I have a connection there through, through my father, he's a mechanic. And then as soon as I saw that NHL job opportunity, I said, it was a contract at the time. Um, I said, I was going to jump on it and, and make the most of it. Uh, and see what it turns into. And so far it's, it's been, it's been amazing. Um, and all the connections and just the doors that it's open and the, the, the uh, you know, all, everything I've learned through it so far has been amazing. Yeah. That's a, that's a great story. And yeah, uh, yeah man, I, I hope it keeps going well for you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. But uh, I wanted to peel back to, to your, to your start of your, your career. So when you finished uh, I guess your undergrad or, you know, your university degree there, 
what was kind of that first step for you like? Um, because I know we have a lot of listeners and, and and fans that are in that time of their life where they're trying to decide what to do through yeah. university and then the first step outside. So I took journalism at Carleton, uh, mm-hmm. way when, and uh, I was going to go to law school. That was my original plan. And halfway through fourth year, I just couldn't, didn't have the stomach to do eight more years or whatever it was going to take to be a lawyer. Um, I really wasn't sure what I wanted to do, uh, only that I liked TV a little bit. And I, uh, you know, so much of life is luck. I, I did an internship at the local TV station in Ottawa. It was a one week internship. It was a great internship though, because they let you do a couple of stories that went on the air. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I guess I did a decent job and the next day was a Saturday and one of their main reporters uh, broke his ribs skiing. And so they needed somebody to cover a shift Sunday. And I guess I was fresh in their mind. Maybe I'd done okay. And uh, so they called me and I covered the shift Monday, Sunday, and then Monday and then Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And I never stopped working there. I, uh, I basically kept working and then they had other shifts for me and then they hired me for the summer and then they hired me full time after the summer. And suddenly I was a news reporter, which is not something I ever wanted to do. But, you know, like you, Lucas, I grabbed the first opportunity I could get and got my foot in the door and hoped at some point I could transition into sports. And eventually that happened. It took a few years. I I ended up I did a couple stints in sports, but basically I was a news reporter for six, seven years before I was able to make the change. But I, in some ways, I think that if I hadn't have been that news reporter, I'm not sure I would have had the career I had because I think it taught me a lot about how to write properly and how to tell stories properly and how to do interviews properly. And so when I came to sports, I was, I think, a lot more experienced than people that maybe just go straight into sports. Because mm-hmm. in some ways, sports is really easy from a, from a reporting, from a storytelling perspective. Sports, you know, you go to the rink, if you're doing a TV story, the visuals are right there. You guys skating around, the players come off, you can interview them. It's easy. Whereas news, you really had to work, you know, work to get interviews and work to get whatever visuals you wanted for a story. So I think, I think there's no chance that I got get to TSN and uh, have the opportunities that I've had without those, those years in news. So um, yeah, it was, that's how it happens. Sometimes a guy breaks his rib skiing and here I am 30 years later. Yeah, James, I, I got to give, uh, yeah, big respect to every, I mean, I, growing up, I've always seen you on my TV, so it's even really cool to chat with you now. Uh, so world juniors are coming up. I, I know it's always a discussion and you're always uh, very involved, uh, just on a world juniors level, just some of the guys that are going, whether it's Bedard, Fantilli, Stankoven, Wright, yeah. uh, go down the list. Uh, is this one of those teams where you look at, and obviously I would say maybe, I don't know if it's the most normal world juniors, like we've seen obviously a couple now, but just in terms of after the pandemic at the right yeah. time with fans in the building, uh, is this one of those world juniors where even I was talking with Lucas about it, it's like the team that they have the stage back to kind of normalcy. Uh, is this a world juniors you're excited about? Yeah, very much so. And for, for all those reasons you mentioned class, I mean, uh, no disrespect to Edmonton, but man, three straight times going to Edmonton, we uh, all under chances like we're at where Alberta really got ripped off, right? They get the bubble the first year and there's great hockey fans out there. And so they can't first year, the second year gets canceled after four or five days and then it gets stuck in the summer when, you know, people are on vacation and they're not really into hockey. So those were three kind of ugly world juniors, plus all the stuff that was going on behind the scenes with uh, uh, the sexual misconduct and in, in investigation. Um, I, I, which is not completely certainly over with and we won't forget it. I think you're right in saying that getting it in a different venue somewhere like Halifax where it hasn't been in 20 years in Moncton, um, having fans back in the building, I think, you know, I think we're getting there and it's going to feel somewhat normal again. And plus that team is staffed. Oh, uh, crazy. We were doing the, the countdown show the other day and, uh, you know, the year's kind of, are a blurry to me, but I feel like this is the most stacked team since that McDavid Max Domi team uh, that won gold in Toronto and Montreal. And what was that? 2015. I lose track of the years. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. I think 2015. Yeah. 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 This team is, uh, this team is stacked. Like 
the returning players were so good in the summer, most of them. Uh, you know, the fact that Fantilli wasn't even locked to make the team until the roster was announced today says something with all his talent. And uh, just to get the chance to watch Connor Bedard again. Uh, and it's still nuts, the fact that he's 17 and you're not supposed to, you're not supposed to do well in this tournament at 17. No matter yeah. you are basically expected to dominate and that's 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 crazy so Zellweger Stankoven I can't I can't wait to watch those two guys again they were just fantastic this summer um so yeah I think it's uh I'm really pumped about it well we were lucky enough to actually have Stankoven on the show and uh man what a story I love stories like that where it's like whether it's an undersized player or a player that's overlooked uh, so many guys that went ahead of him in that draft and just his skill set and the stars. I mean, that's another whole storyline, the Dallas stars on stacking up draft picks and players, but uh, Stan Coven's a really cool story. I think that world juniors in the summer, even though obviously the exposure wasn't there to the full amount, but that was truly Stan Coven's like, coming out party. I think. Well, mm-hmm. the first few games, it was funny because the first few games, I think McTavish and Bedard were playing together and they, they made yeah. some match first maybe two games and that's all anybody was talking about it and the stank open line was quiet uh, like first two maybe picked it up a bit in the third the fourth and fifth six games i i thought he was probably the best player on, yeah, on the ice so yeah uh you know just did something every single shift and so yeah i think that Again, all the attention will be on Bedard and Sanko will be, you know, semi-forgotten again by the masses, and then the tournament will start, and, and he'll probably dominate. So, I didn't even mention Gunther; he's in there as well. It's so stacked. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's a it's a great it's a great group. You know, there's some years where Canada is, you know, just kind of look at Canada's always got a chance at gold every year in this tournament, but there's some years where you know the Finns or the Americans or the Swedes look. A, or the Russians when they used to be there, you would be a notch above. And I, yeah. I think Canada is clearly above everybody else. And uh, it doesn't mean they're going to win gold, but they have a chance to, to run the table for sure. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, James, we wanted to ask you too, regarding Connor Bedard, what team uh, do you think you would like to, you know, from your angle, give us a couple teams that you'd like to see him. Uh, maybe suit up for uh, next season after he's drafted or suit up for in, in the summer, I should say on draft day. Well, I'm always just selfish for the Canadian teams. Like yeah. uh, I always like the stars to uh, end up in a place where we get to talk about them every day. Um, I suppose at this point in time, you know, Montreal's playing too well to get the high lottery odds. Ottawa uh, perhaps could slide down or <laughs> we, I don't know. Well, we were discussing that earlier, Bedard versus Matthews for the next 10 years, if Matthews stays, of course. <laughs> I don't know. Who's dead last right now? Is it like... Uh, right now, it's the Ducks. Yeah. They have like one regulation win or something, right? <laughs> something <People>. like that. <laughs> so right now, we got right now we got bottom five Ducks, Blackhawks, Blue Jackets, Coyotes, and Sharks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you know, I, you go away to Qatar for three weeks and <laughs> I missed a lot. But... Uh, I, you know, if, if it was going to be one of those five, you know, I, I always love Chicago as an original six team. And, uh, you know, they're on a little bit of a downswing here, but, you know, a couple of years and some decent drafting and maybe being back up. So I could see Connor Bedard looking pretty good in a Hawks jersey. Uh, I wouldn't, uh, no offense to either of these franchises, but, you know, Anaheim, boy, he, Anaheim would be pretty exciting in a few years with Bedard, McTavish, and, uh, Zegris uh, yeah. and everybody else, but San Jose, Anaheim, Arizona—I don't know—a unique talent like that. I feel like they get a little lost out there. So uh, I'd, I'd rather him be in a bigger market. But that's a really horrible, uh, you know, East Coast bias way of looking at things. Yeah, well, I think the Bedard one is even like I, I to me, it's not even a debate. It's like the same old like. Obviously, we have to talk about the Matthews line, a debate, like all these debates. I don't think Bedard's a debate, but I mean, the talent that follows him in that draft class is just insane. So the five teams we just mentioned are getting crazy talents regardless. Um, but to flip it from the bottom to the top here, James, if I recall correctly, please correct me if I'm wrong. I do believe going to the playoffs last year, you had the Flames as your cup pick. So if we're on that Canadian team lens, I think that was your team, right? That you picked? Yeah, probably. I, I yeah. just want to. 
little little behind the scenes inside baseball stuff. What what usually happens on that show is that I get a list of everybody's picks. Okay. And make a pick that's a, a little more interesting for television. So if they've all picked Tampa or Colorado, then you know I'll pick Calgary just to sexy it up a little bit. Uh, so uh, I take one for the team sometimes. Yeah. That's <laughs> Well, that's, that's even more respects, but yeah. So there you go. You're sticking to the Canadian storylines, which I love. So on the Canadian storylines, if we look at the season, I know in Leafland, we can throw out season standings all, all day long, but uh, in terms of the Jets and Leafs, kind of in that conversation, do you, if we're talking about that next Canadian team winning the cup, cause it's been a minute here, who's your team right now as it stands that you see doing it? Oh man, you guys are just setting me up to get, Sorry, James. We're getting you with the tough questions here with the Darcy Tucker jersey in the background. <laughs> well, like you just, you know, there's no. I would, I would pick Toronto over Winnipeg. Like I, I think, looking at the rosters right now, that Toronto has a better chance to win the Stanley Cup than, than Winnipeg. I, I really do. Although, you know, Rick Bonus, who is near and dear to my heart, because when I was starting in Ottawa, he was coaching the Sens, and he's such a quality guy. And, he got fired by the Sens and I had to go over to his house and interview him on his driveway with his kids there. And I always felt really bad about it. So uh, I love what Bones is doing with, with the Jets and I would love to see them. And if Hellebuck can stay sort of Vesna caliber, who knows? Um, I think Toronto has more talent than Winnipeg for sure. But Lucas, man, you, you can ho- wave that Jersey around, but until they mm-hmm. win around, you know, we can't really say anything, can we? Like, how how do you pick Toronto when they haven't won a round in 20 years? <laughs> no. That's the hardest thing for me to do. And I think one of these years it's going to happen, and I really believe if they win a round, they're going to win. You know, they'll go to a cup final or at least a conference final if they can get through a first round. Yeah. But uh, I don't know. If they end up with Tampa again in the first round, <laughs> and, you know, and, and Boston, Boston continues to have the season they're having, so – I just, I, I can't, I can't pick the Leafs. And I still think that, you know, the Oilers are off to a, not the best start. The Flames are not off to the best start, but it's a long season. And uh, I actually think if, I'll probably say Edmonton, because I, I just think that that group probably has the best chance. And uh, there's not quite as much talent in the West. You know, Colorado is still a beast, but tough to go back to back. So I still think if Edmonton can get into a playoff spot, that they could do some damage. Yeah, so if, I'll, I'll say the Oilers. Yeah, if if Edmonton can just get like nine oh five goaltending, I think yeah. they're super super serious. But just so far, the goaltending has been such a struggle. Jack Campbell, um, weird dude. He's gonna go on a he'll go on another hot streak at some point here, and he'll win like you know fifteen to sixteen with a nine forty eight save percentage. He's just a weird goalie that way. And I, I, he, I thought he was fine for Toronto in the playoffs last year. So if he can figure it out by, uh, by playoff time, I think they got a decent crack. Yeah. Clip that Johnny clip that if the Oilers Let's actually go on this, in. remember that clip. Yeah. <laughs> uh, James, just to wrap it up here. I, I love the bucket list conversation. Uh, so just to, obviously we talked about the things that you've been able to do, which world cup check. Uh, is there anything else kind of moving forward on your career here? I mean, podcasts, books, trips? Like, is there anything else you kind of want to accomplish uh, or any goals you have set? Because I think at any point in your career, there's always going to be those new goals that you set for yourself. Yeah, yeah, you know, I was thinking about that the other day and uh, uh, I don't want to say no because then I'll feel like it's time to retire, uh, which (laughs) I love what I do and I want to keep doing this for lots more years. So uh, there's nothing that sticks out like, like a World Cup did. I mean, a World Cup in Canada in 2026 would be pretty cool. Yeah. Hopefully I can be part of that. Um, I'd love to hang around for a Canadian team being in the Stanley Cup final again and winning the Stanley Cup and being part of that, whoever that team is. And, uh, I, you know, it's, people have a hard time probably believing because everyone's so tied to whatever Canadian team they are. I, I really don't care. I would take like any of the seven uh, winning the Stanley Cup, I think would be amazing in this country. And uh, uh, I'd be there for it no matter who it is. So that's there for sure. Um, I'd love to do a few more Olympic games. Uh, it's always been a Olympics is funny because, you know, most of the stuff I get to do every year, the masters, which I love and the world juniors, which I love and the cup final and, and the super bowl and the great cup. 
but the Olympics, because of networks, you don't always get to do them, right? I, I did them and I did it. I was there in 06. I was there. I hosted in 2010, 2012. I got to host hockey uh, this past year for the CBC. were kind enough to have me on, but I don't think anybody was watching because there was no NHLers and it was the middle of the night. Um, so I, I'd love to be able to do some more Olympics, but that gets a little tricky with the network. So I'm, I'm not sure I, I'll get that opportunity. But uh, like you said, boys, I, I feel so lucky to have done all those things. Like I, when I was growing up in Ottawa, I never thought for a second, like I thought if I could get, you know, cover Ottawa Rough Riders and Ottawa 67 games, that would be an amazing career. And uh, I didn't dream big. So I didn't dream of all those things that I told you about today. And so I feel just so lucky that I've been given the chance to cover all those things. And uh I try not to think about it too much and wait till I'm old and retired and can sit back and look back on everything and have a beer and go, man, that was pretty cool. Unreal, yeah. man. Uh, yeah. James, I got to say when you were, when we're looking at the, the big guys on the screen, you've done quite a bit. So it's a lot to inspire to, to at least try to achieve half of it or even a quarter. <laughs> so uh, thank you, James. Honestly, this was a, this was a really good chat. Uh, John Lucas, my, my pleasure. And, uh, like I say, even though I'm old, I, I certainly remember when I was you guys and just starting out. And uh, I had a lot of frustrating years, those years in news where I thought I would never get the chance to do sports. And, uh, you know, so you're always you're already ahead of me from where I was then. Like I was it wasn't I got the call from TSN. I think I was 30, 31 years old. So, uh, um, you know, keep doing what you're doing and uh Come steal my job and give me a few more, a few more years. All right. <laughs> all right, James. Yeah, it's absolutely inspiring. Um, like John said too, I mean, you've been on our televisions at home since we were in grade school, right? So uh, thanks a lot for coming on. Really appreciate it. And we'll put a bow on it. Thanks so much. Thanks boys. Really appreciate it, man. Thanks for having me. Best of luck yeah. with everything. Thank you so much for the time, man. Keep all in right, touch. Man. Okay. All right. Chat soon, man. Thank you. Thank you. That is huge. Wow. I, I got to say, man, I, I'll I'll give him the shout here as we're wrapping up. Uh, make sure you guys go check out his pod, Rubber Boots. Go get his books, read it up. I, I'll say this. It's, and this is not a shot at anyone. It is so tough sometimes to like people in the industry and people that have such busy schedules. Like this guy just came back from the World Cup and we know how busy he is. And like even the 20, 30 minutes he gave us, like that is like way more than we can expect. Oh, absolutely, man. Massive, like really big respects, especially once you've, uh, you know, accomplished a lot in your career. It's very easy to uh, dismiss like opportunities that, you know, aren't as uh, appealing, maybe from just not a financial pers uh, perspective, but other perspectives, um, big respects to James for coming on and, and just uh, shooting it with us, giving us some good advice and uh, just bringing good content to hot take hockey. Yeah. And, and honestly, it's huge respects to the fact that like, obviously like when I was in contact with them, I was giving them a little background on like both of us and just like kind of our aspirations and what we've been up to. So uh, the fact that like he was so responsive and saying like he recognized both of us as like young uh, guys, like trying to get into the industry in just certain ways. And uh, yeah, man, I mean, Frank, like I said, back from guitar, he was sick and like, he's got so much hockey stuff coming on TSN and He's spending a Monday evening with us for even just the quick, the quick 20, 30. But I mean, man, the stories he was telling us, uh, anything you kind of took from it as we just wrap the pod. Um, I think it's unbelievable. Just the, uh, the amount of events he's covered and, you know, it's the pinnacle of sport, the events he's covered. Yeah. Uh, but I think honestly, he, he's going to really look forward to that world cup here in Canada. I think that's going to be unbelievable. Similar vibes to when we hosted the Olympics in Vancouver, yeah. uh, it, yeah, I think that's going to be unbelievable, unbelievable for him. Excuse me, but uh, James Deathly, what a champ! What a champ! What a legend! Make sure you guys support Deathly, man. What a beauty! Uh, huge thanks to him. And yeah, 18th episode. I think we've talked about it, Lucas. Like marking that 20, and I've talked about other people that do podcasts. Like that 20th episode, we do we rip through the first 20, and like the timing of it, man. We're gonna get through the first 20 before the new year. So that's pretty perfect timing if you ask me um anything else you want to say to the, the viewers or anyone watching on the way out here thanks for watching thanks for listening everybody uh we'll we'll talk next week and i'll have an update for you on uh, how msg went and how new york went hey eh, john
Oh yeah, Lucas, man. Yeah. Have a beauty trip. I forgot, man. I won't be seeing you on the weekend, but you'll be in New York. So I, I think yes. you'll be enjoying yourself. Enjoy, enjoy our cousins Christmas. I'm sorry I can't attend this year, but we'll be we'll <laughs> so, be in touch. It's all good. We'll do a little quick two minute FaceTime. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Thank you guys so much. Episode 18. We'll see you on the next week. Huge shout out to James Duffy. And we'll see who we have on next. Thank you so much from Lucas, John. Have a good one. Peace. Peace.